Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. Great to be with you on a Tuesday. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, as uh, we are ready to roll. Plenty to talk about going on in Rosemont, Illinois. What's up with the Big Ten? Schedule-wise, contract-wise, TV, all that good stuff. ABC out with some primetime games. We'll tell you about odds for the title. Interesting, but not completely shocking. We'll spend time with Mitch Sherman from The Athletic. About 425 or so, Mitch will join us this first hour. In hour two, a Tuesday with Kaz, Rick Kaczynski. Get Kaz's take on JUCO evaluation. What's he think about JUCO defensive linemen uh, near and far as Nebraska in the thick of it for Taylor Lewis? Looks like he'll probably do a visit May 27th. Nebraska take him and win. Still no big timeline yet on win. The potential Alabama get for Nebraska. The division reconfigurement is up in the air. That's a discussion point. Great topic to dive into when it comes to most intriguing for Nebraska football. Uh, a good list of three games by HaleVarsity.com. And uh, we'll spend time with Mike St. James uh, the last 20 minutes. Better Call Saul, as uh, Axe to Grind, the latest episode, the series halftime uh, next Monday before the second and final close to one of the best shows on TV. Numbers to get in, 466-3776-466-3776-800-825-5865. can email the show, Chris at Hale Varsity. Dot com And uh, give us a find and follow on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio and at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. Elijah, what do you know? What's shaking? Uh, how are you today? I'm doing very well today. It's a, a lovely Tuesday. I, I keep on. This is now the second consecutive day where I've woken up and thought it was Wednesday. So that takes a little adjusting in the morning, you know, getting that out of the way. But uh, doing pretty well, all things considered. Uh, looking forward to my little sister's got a uh, a choir concert tonight, which I'm Good. going to after uh, this show ends. So looking forward to that. And then my Avalanche are playing tonight at 830 game one against the Blues. That is good. Go Avs. Thank you. There's a few St. Louis contingent uh, around the building and in the city, but a lot of Avs fans. Uh, so, the Blues don't stand a chance. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's your hope anyway. So let's talk a little bit here about intriguing matchups. I, I love this. And as you go through Nebraska's schedule, uh, every game's important. We can get into what should be Nebraska's start versus what will be Nebraska's start. It's it's always in question just because it's been kind of a uh, well a turbulent ride here these last four years, based on what expectations were meant to be and what they really ended up being. What was the reality of where Nebraska football's at? And the the schedule talks interesting, and and I think in in comparison, it's really a no brainer to say, listen, it, it sets up well for Nebraska if you get that first one. We've talked with Brandon Vogel about it. You and I've talked about it. Different people we like around the football world have chimed in. It is off season. It is it is middle of May, and we all know how important number one or zero is against Northwestern for this team, this program, this season to get off on the right foot. It's it, it's not irrevocable. It's not that you can't recover from a toe stub, but it gets pretty heavy, pretty thick, pretty pressurized uh, for 2022 if you don't do your thing in Dublin, Oklahoma, September 17th. You get a bye week, and then there's the Big Ten gauntlet with Indiana and Rutgers. Can't overlook those two before you head to Purdue. You get to catch your breath before Illinois and the Pig Farmer, Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa. Physical football to end 
October through November. So when we talk about the intriguing matchups, you could say, you know, there's an argument by November 12th. What's Nebraska going to be like for the stretch run with no bye weeks? Three straight weeks and a short week against Iowa. You could circle Michigan. That's intriguing, right? How do you stack up against the perceived best in the East? You can look at where you're at against a Minnesota team, right, a a week or two earlier. Or even Purdue that may be one of the favorites based on how their bowl game went and what's coming back, although their top receiver is academically ineligible. That is a kick in the junk for Purdue. Oklahoma, that's a national setup stage. That's a that's a big time ball game between yesteryear and one team's gonna be ranked and a favorite in their division slash conference and Nebraska's trying to, to be there. But I like the 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 list here that HailVarsity.com put out. Their three most intriguing games for twenty twenty two Northwestern, totally agree that's number one on my list. Number two is Illinois. And number three is Minnesota. And I get the math on this. There are bigger names. There are better heavyweights to measure yourself against. But if we're truthful, Nebraska has not done what they've needed to do against the teams. Say it with me. They're supposed to beat. In, in, in the last three years, 2019, 2020, 2021, What's Nebraska's record? What's their what's Nebraska's combined record? Well, <laughs> they they are <laughs> they are two and seven against those three teams. That is awful. You got worked in twenty nineteen, you lost to a thirty three man COVID filled roster in twenty twenty. You couldn't come back and score inside the ten against Minnesota last year. You're 0 and 3 the last 3 years against the Gophers. You're o, you're, you're you're 1 and 2 against Illinois. Could damn well easily be 0 and 3 without some Wandale heroics before game day in Ohio State invaded the week later in 2019. You got rocked in 2020 at home by Illinois, 285 on the ground. And you got beat last year in the week 0 game. A weird, weird ball game with special teams mishaps and a failed two-minute drill. Northwestern, you beat probably their worst team in 2019, 13-10. You you lost a golden opportunity because you kept playing quarterback merry-go-round in 2020. And then you did what you were supposed to do as an angry football team after the Sparty loss came out and annihilated the team you're better on paper and you're better athletically then. You killed Northwestern 56-7. to That, I think if you pull most Nebraska fans, but Trev Alberts is right, the world has changed, everyone's gotten better, and it's just not roll your helmet out there anymore for Nebraska, and it's been that way through two coaching changes. And the, the only time Nebraska's really gone out there and done what they're supposed to do in Big Ten play, you could argue in the last three years, was last year. Uh, You could make a a, a case against Minnesota 2018 and then the Snowball game in in, in 2018, 9-6 win in the snow against Sparty. Impressive win. Probably the best win. But you come out and, and you annihilate Northwestern last year like you did. That's the one time you've come out and and kind of flexed your muscles against some of the teams. Look, it's typically going to be a three-team race in the West while there are West and East divisions. It's Iowa, it's Wisconsin, and then there's Nebraska, 14, Minnesota. And and quite honestly, it's been Northwestern two of the last four years that have won the thing. But Nebraska now, when we talk about intriguing games and where they're at on the schedule – you need to beat Northwestern to get off on the right foot. People that look like you, as coaches say, Minnesota, right? You, you recruit some talented kids, but overall you develop really well. That's what Minnesota does. Can you, can you be as physical as Minnesota? Because that's a good indication 
to me that if you can match physicality and win physicality against a Minnesota and an Illinois, you can be in the ball game against an Iowa and a Wisconsin. And by the way, Nebraska's been in all the games against Iowa uh, post Riley era. They, they have not been in all the games against Wisconsin. A couple of double digit losses and then last year's shootout. <laughs> Shockingly, a shootout. Couldn't stop the run. And, and by the way, he couldn't stop the run against Illinois, couldn't stop the run against Minnesota the last couple of seasons. Problematic. And you know what Bielema is going to do? You know what Minnesota is going to do? They're going to run the football. So I think these are, they're not the fun picks. They're not the sexy picks. But they're probably on target this year as far as all right, measuring Nebraska football. Do they do what they're supposed to do or does it look the same? Because if they're going to lose again a fourth year in a row to Minnesota at home, they're going to lose at home for a a third time in four years against Illinois, something crazy is going to go on, and it's going to be sloppy football. It's going to be mistakes adding to what a Minnesota, what a Illinois, what a Northwestern do. And to circle those three games, that to me signifies, listen, Nebraska's got to be a different looking football team they've got not just the obvious great defense solid offense taking care of the football better on special teams but you've not seen it to, to win those three games on the schedule next year you're gonna have to play you're not not just out talent but out tough and i think that's i think these are three solid picks and, and really aside from the games of north dakota georgia southern Rutgers, and indiana you can't go wrong with your picks here I think you can make a good argument, make for, argument the, for, for the other for, eight games and for three, yeah, yeah, and even Indiana and Rutgers, you could make an argument for because they're they're Big Ten play, and you're going to need those wins by the end of the season if you want to be bowl eligible. So you can really make a, an argument for just about any of these games. Northwestern makes a lot of sense because it's about getting off on the right foot. Uh, it's going to be the game where you you see if all the talk in fall camp has come to fruition, if it's correct, uh, if Nebraska can start a season off strong for once. Uh, that's that's a good pick. I'll. I'll Stick with that one, fine. Minnesota's fine. I really like, I think Michigan's an intriguing prospect. You go into the big house, which is a, a tough place to go play. And it's overrated. And you're, okay. No, I'm saying, I'm saying atmosphere-wise, as far as a toxic, crazy, it was off the hook for Ohio State last year. Mm-hmm. That's the first time in 100 years it's been just crazy, toxic to go into that stadium they have a lot of people it doesn't sound like it doesn't sound well, like I, i've heard i've never actually been to the big house but from my friends who have been they say it's kind of spread out away from the field so as you start getting up levels you feel pretty disconnected and it doesn't stay loud but you're going up against the, the former big 10 champion and a team that was in or the defending big 10 champion and a team that was in the college football playoff last year michigan i mean those all four of those last four games have a great great argument for being intriguing wisconsin and iowa could both be deciding uh, who's going to be taking home the West? Mm-hmm. It's both of those games, and you're trying to get off the schneid against both of those teams. I mean, how many straight have you lost to Wisconsin? I think seven, all of them, seven or eight straight to Wisconsin, nine. You've been in the league ten years, so you've you're you're one in nine against them. And it's it was that game at home back in 2012. 2012. So you're yeah you're yeah, you started one and one against them, and you ended two and uh, one and two against them in 2012. And then you haven't won since. <laughs> so, you, I mean, trying to get off the shot against Wisconsin, and then Iowa with your eight straight losses or whatever that's been as 2014. well. 2014. Yeah. So I, you can really make an argument for any of those last four games. You, you can't go wrong answering this question, I don't think, because every single game this season has intrigue as we look at it now. As we, as we get into the season, I'm sure teams will rise and fall, and this intrigue will, will diminish on some teams. But really, you can make an argument for just about any of these teams aside from North Dakota, Georgia Southern? Well, and from a point total standpoint and a spread standpoint, you have some early odds by Brian Edwards Sports. And right now you have Nebraska favored 9.5 Northwestern. They're dogged by 4.5 to Oklahoma. They're plus 11.5 at Oak, at uh, Michigan. They're plus 3 against Wisconsin. They're plus 3.5 at Iowa, so they're underdogged in four of those five games listed. But you look at the schedule and say, okay, you can find several losses, you can find several wins, and even of the losses, since it is the off season and everyone's undefeated, you can talk yourself into, all right, this and this and this happened, maybe Nebraska 
finds their way and goes and earns a victory, right? You're not overwhelmed by Wisconsin's quarterback play. You're not overwhelmed by Iowa's quarterback play. They do about everything else great, uh, specifically running the football and getting after you defensively. Michigan isn't completely void, but their defense isn't what it was last year. Minnesota, who knows? That bald, that little bald, crazy guy finds a way to win and irritates you in doing it. Brett Bielema, hell, he may not throw a pass if he still has art at quarterback. So, to me, just kind of along the, the same lines here, of these home games that are on the schedule, which do you think will have the most rock in Memorial Stadium? Oh, I, I think it's going to be Oklahoma. You think it's going to be Oklahoma? Abs- absolutely. I think depending on the circumstances, it could be Wisconsin as well. Well, if, if Wisconsin's coming off a win against Iowa the week before that, I don't know that you're going to get... That game could determine who's going to win the Big Ten West. That game could also be rocking. I, I think that's a good way to look at this is the, the fans who are going into the games, which ones are they going to be most intrigued by? You're I would go be, Oklahoma you're gonna be geeked and Wisconsin. Up, you're gonna, well, absolutely. You're going to be geeked up for Oklahoma, Wisconsin. There's, uh, there's a, lot of, a lot of dislike for Minnesota. We'll get Mitch's take on this. Most intriguing games. He'll give us three. We'll talk divisions with him. Also get a thought on what the Big Ten does uh, with their media rights. Mitch Sherman's next. It's uh, Hail Varsity. We're presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Hello, listener. Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with Hail Varsity Radio, and I wanted to let you know about a special deal just for listeners of the Hail Varsity Radio Show podcast. We're offering $10 off the annual subscription price of $29.99. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we do. 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all the premium content we produce at HailVarsity.com. Just go to HailVarsity.com backslash subscribe and enter in the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hail Varsity. That's HailVarsity.com backslash subscribe promo code GBR. And we're back. Fellas, you think we could listen to the radio? On Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Thanks for spending time. Hail Varsity on a Tuesday. We welcome in Mitch Sherman from The Athletic and Mitch Sherman on Twitter. Mitch, what do you know? Just another Tuesday. Um, I'm, uh, I'm doing well. Up here in Sarpy County. How are you, Chris? We're good. We're dodging a few sprinkles and maybe a thunderstorm and waiting on Legion tryouts, man. That's what we're doing. How's the uh, the old Gretna Ball Club? Uh, not too bad. Had a uh, uh, average tournament showing uh, over the weekend, hoping for better uh, in a couple weeks. But yeah, we are we are dodging thunderstorms today. Also, we had some had some mega lightning bolts come through the Gretna area a couple hours ago. shook like shook the uh, uh, shook the foundation of my of my house. I sat here in my living room pounding out a, a, a foot some football content. Did it hit a tree? And is there a wood bat laying in your yard? <laughs> Not that I've discovered. Um, <laughs> it sure sounded like it, and it felt like it, it hit something. There and. Uh, I may have to go out on an, on an investigative mission here uh, shortly. Well, uh, go pick out a good one, as they say. Mitch Sherman with us. So a lot going on in Illinois, Chicago, Rosemont specifically with the athletic directors and, uh, of course, Commissioner Warren. Mitch, what's your gut tell you on, on divisions or no for the Big Ten moving forward? That's been the talk for the ACC and probably some configuration coming with the SEC once Texas and Oklahoma join the party. Do you have a feel for what the Big Ten may do? I don't have a great feel, but I kind of think if I had to, if I had to uh, put my finger on something that we're headed toward um, a, 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 um, a place in college sports where divisions are, are, are not there, um, not necessarily in every conference, but I think speaking specifically about the Big Ten, um, you know, clearly the NCAA or, or you know, the, the college sports in general are moving toward um, a system where the divisions are not prioritized. Um, no longer are, are there going to be requirements. And, and you know, you can, you can, you can look around, uh, around college football and see, and see this coming, um, you know, with the, with the way the Big 12 is structured um, or has been structured in, in, the, in, in what it does with the championship game. We're, we're, what I'm saying is we're, we're heading toward a place where they're not really necessary. 
And I think in the Big Ten, you know, the, the, the main reason or one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that you've seen the division structure um, remain in place, you know, whether, whether it was East and West or, or Legends and Leaders is because it was, it was essentially mandated in order to structure the championship game the way that the conference wanted. And, and you know, that's probably not going to be the case down the road. So you can be more creative with scheduling um, and potentially uh, create a more attractive situation for your TV partners, your media rights partners, if you cut those divisions so that there doesn't have to be, um, you know, a Wisconsin-Purdue game every year or uh, a Michigan-Maryland game every year. So, yeah, I think that's where we're headed, and it'll be real interesting to see for a school like Nebraska, how it's impacted that, you know, I can't sit here right now and pretend to have a great idea of how it will shake out. But, you know, my hope, and I think the hope of Nebraska fans and administrators and, and people in the athletic department, at least on the football part of it, is that you preserve some of these games, Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota at the top of mind that have, started to turn into, um, you know, contests that have importance just beyond the, the, the division standings. Totally agree. And if you're the Big Ten, your second best team, a lot of times out of the East, either fell to Ohio State or beat Ohio State. So Ohio State was out of it, not often. But their, so their consolation is the Rose Bowl, likely. But it, because they weren't playing in the conference title game, right, right, they're 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 not part of the playoff discussion. Depending on how much the CFP expands, whether it goes to from four to six or four to eight or twelve or wh- wherever we go, yeah, you know, position yourself to get your your champ and your runner up in, and then have a good argument for a third team. And from a West standpoint, you have yet to win a, a Big Ten title game. Yeah, I do think that conference, uh, I'm sorry, that, that um, college football playoff expansion goes hand in hand with division elimination um, for the reasons that you just did a really good job of detailing. So I won't, I won't repeat it. But, you know, if it's Michigan and Ohio State as top 10 teams and they're knocking each other out of, one is knocking the other out of the Big Ten championship game, that is detrimental to your end goal. Uh, to get as many teams as possible into an expanded playoff. So if you create the possibility that they can rematch in a conference championship game, you know, you open yourself up as a league to make more money and get more exposure. And that's, that's probably a good thing. It's definitely a good thing. Um, not just for Kevin Warren in the league, but for, for all of its members. Mitch, if, if this is what's put into place here, a, a divisionless big 10, how quickly do you think the, the gears would be moving to, to get this in effect with, with TV rights renewal coming up here soon? I mean, could this be something we're seeing next season? I, 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 and by next season, I should say uh, 2023. No, I, I think, and going back to what I just said about college football playoff expansion, I, I think that those things will go hand in hand. And it'll, it'll, it'll get lined up. If this happens, um, it'll get lined up so that when the playoff expands, if the playoff expands, it, it, it eventually will expand, and, and you know you're potentially looking at 2026 as the first possibility. That to me would also be an ideal time to change the structure of the way that the Big Ten does its scheduling. Mitch, we were talking intriguing games. Hale Varsity's got a list of, of three they had circled, and I can't argue with him because Nebraska. Overall, just pretty poor, quite honestly. Uh, uh, 0-3 against Minnesota, 0-3, make it, excuse me, 1-2 and against Illinois, and then 2-1 uh, and uh, two and one, uh, against Northwestern. They circled Minnesota, Illinois, and, and Northwestern is three of the more intriguing games for, for 2022. You can make an argument for all of them. Off the top of your head, a couple of games that you are – kind of locked in on or thinking about sort of kind of this early? Well, of course, Northwestern, because uh, for the same reasons that I was so locked in on Illinois right. at this time a year ago, 
it's you know it's a it's just a repeat scenario. Um, you know, just put it in, plunk it down in Ireland instead of Champaign, Illinois, which you know is, that's that's where the that's where the Illinois game was supposed to be in the first place. So there's some parallels there. But yeah, for a lot of the same reasons, um, it, it's got a lot. It, it's got intrigue. Although this time you're going against the Northwestern team that Nebraska beat by seven touchdowns in Lincoln a year ago. So. You know that's a factor. I think on both sides, um, you, if you're Nebraska, you would hope that it provides you with uh, a, a mental edge. But you know, I, you know, Northwestern is going to try to flip that and, and use it as motivation. And, and Pat Fitzgerald is a is a good coach in that way. Um, and he's going to have his team geared up for that game because of what happened in Lincoln last year. So I think Nebraska is going to get Northwestern's best shot. They're not going to be beat down. Um, you know, I don't think they're going to get physically whipped the way that Nebraska did to Northwestern um, at Memorial Stadium, especially with the inexperience up front on both sides of the ball for the Huskers. So that's an intriguing game for me. You know, if we're sticking to Big Ten, I'm obviously intrigued by Oklahoma and, yeah. and the Sooners coming to Lincoln for the first time in, in 20-plus years. But – um, if, uh, well, maybe not that long, but it seems like, like it's been, been that, been that, it's, yeah, it's about that long, 15 years. Um, you know, I, I'm intrigued by, um, I just, just pick any of them. Minnesota. Yeah. Sure. Um, Minnesota coming to Lincoln after the way things have gone in recent years in that series, I think is a good litmus test for where Nebraska's at. Um, in the second half of year five under Scott Frost. And ultimately, in the 2022 season, that's what we're trying to find out, right? Where is Nebraska at? Where is Nebraska at um, after October 1st when that buyout's cut in half and, and it becomes a different conversation about the future, um, his future and the, and the future of the program? So, I mean, you can look at the, any of those games in November, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa. They're all barometer games, but the Minnesota one to me, is you know it's the first of those four, and it's especially intriguing um, because Minnesota just just has been a team that I think Nebraska fans have have um, had a chip on their shoulder about. Maybe the program has had a little bit of a chip on its shoulder about you know and, and not not really wanting to accept that Minnesota is in a better place as a football program, but the results on the field in recent years would indicate otherwise. So if you want a real good gauge of where Nebraska's at in comparison to uh, you know where it thinks it should be. Um, and the fact that that game is in Lincoln, um, it's a good one to watch. Mitch Sherman with The Athletic, at Mitch Sherman on Twitter is where you follow him. Mitch, uh, your take right now on recruiting momentum for Nebraska. A couple of big fish still out there. Uh, you got win from Bama that hasn't decided. Taylor Lewis uh, is looking to make a, a, a trip. A, tr- a trek to Lincoln from JUCO, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, overall it's been pretty successful. Aside from the Riola news, what's your feel on on how things are going? Well, yeah, on the transfer front, and, you know, and, uh, you can the JUCO kids, you can you can put them on in either category. You know, traditionally they're they are um, more grouped with the high school recruits, but but now um, since transfers are such a big, a big part of the recruiting efforts, you know, they, that junior college players can go either way. And really when I look at this incoming class, uh, you know, we're talking about 2023s here in this, in this conversation, but when I look at the, well, and 22s, um, uh, with the transfers, when I, when I look at this incoming class, you know, I tend to group those three junior college kids, um, Deshaun Singleton, Anthony Grant, um, and Javier Morton uh, more with the Division One transfers than I do with uh, with the high school kids, just because of the the chance that I think they have to make a quick impact, especially Grant and Singleton, um, who were who were two of the top uh, early enrollees in the spring. Um, yeah, that that side of it, um, the transfer part, I think Nebraska likes the way it's going. I mean, in recent just in recent weeks, you've had O'Shawn Mathis and Devin Drew, and then Kane Williams, the transfer from Alabama. Um, who was a top 200 player nationally just just a year ago out of high school uh, in Louisiana? So that's that's all. Those are all positive, um, big positives. And then you know momentum um, has probably slowed a little bit on the on the high school uh, side of things. Although you know it's going to gear up real quick here in June with a ton of official visits, and you would expect that there's going to be commitments to follow those official visits. Um, but right now it's been a while since Nebraska's had. Uh, commitments from high school players in the uh, in the 2023 class. So, um, you know, opportunities are coming up, and and you know, we're going to see just this um, 
you know, this week in the state of Nebraska. Um, some eye-opening uh, performances, I, I would expect, at the state track meet um, out of some guys who are at least one, one guy for sure. Uh, and talking about Malachi Coleman, who is very high um, on Nebraska's wish list. So, uh, you know, you got a you got a guy with his size who is potentially running a 10-400 um, or maybe lower. Uh, that's, uh, you know, we, we talked a year ago about those 22s and all uh, the kids from Omaha and how essential it was for Nebraska to get them. And, and, and you know, it, it swung and missed. Well, you know, here's another with, with Malachi Coleman. So um, the momentum that Nebraska is going to have moving forward in 2023 with recruiting, I, I think, starts right there um, in the city of Lincoln with, with a big time prospect. Mitch, thanks for the time. Always good to chat, bud. We'll talk soon. OK, thanks, Chris. Hello, listener. This is Brandon Vogel, Managing Editor of Hale Varsity, and I wanted to let you know about a special deal just for listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast. We're offering $10 off the annual subscription price of $29.99. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we produce, 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all of the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe and enter the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's hailvarsity.com slash subscribe, promo code GBR. Chime in, 402-466-ESPN, or email the show, chris at hailvarsity.com. Just try me, try me. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back with you, it's Hale Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. And quick uh, recap here on Taylor Lewis, Juco defensive tackle of the College of the Canyons. Talked with Greg Smith and uh, Nebraska in a dogfight for Lewis. It sounds like I think a tweet just went out. Greg Smith put that out there. The original visit weekend, I think, was this weekend for Oregon State for Lewis. I think he's going to hold to that. So Nebraska's looking at the, uh, the 27th or the, the end of May, perhaps. So Nebraska in contention with Auburn and Missouri and Arkansas and Oregon State. And we'll get into this with Kaz, just scouting defensive linemen. Uh, they're at a premium. <laughs> and you, you hope a guy can come in and, and contribute at a high level. Uh, Lewis is a guy that has played pretty good football, but was undiscovered a bit except for Washington State back in January, uh, the only Power Five to offer him, and that was a vicinity thing. But uh, everyone's kicking the tires on the Chicago kid. Other uh, news, maybe an official visit this weekend from another receiver, Marcus Washington, four-star guy, two years to play, three total years, visited Purdue, no NIL. At Purdue, Nebraska has NIL opportunities, but Nebraska wants to grab a couple more defensive linemen. Elijah, it's going to be interesting to see who is on the road again, be a grad transfer or medical red shirt from a scholarship total distribution number, because Nebraska's probably uh, full to the brim right now, and they need some attrition to bring in some new bodies. I'm not sneezing at Marcus Washington. I'm sure there's familiarity with him and Casey, but yeah, Washington pri- comes from Texas, correct? Yes, yes. So the the priority though is getting Win and Lewis, or at least one of them, and we'll see where where Win ends up. Uh, Georgia Tech, Nebraska, kind of arm wrestling. Still, no news, no real timeline. Gotta love what uh, PGA Championships doing Southern Hills. Aside from their ultra. Ultra beer prices, 18 bucks for a tall boy. Sweet Lord. That's more than baseball. <laughs> uh, you have Tiger paired with Spieth and Rory. You have kind of a sounding board as guys are getting their practice rounds in. Ricky Fowler is a guy that you're kind of waiting to blow up and wasn't, wasn't totally poo-pooing the... Dubai situation over in London that Phil is is at. You have Nicholas offered $100 million by the Saudi-backed tour to appear. Rory sounding off. Phil should be here. He went more in-depth with his commentary, but 
Rory wasn't wrong. Love or hate Phil, he was the story of golf last year at 50, winning the PGA. Now your defending champ is off making money. Don't know if he needs it or just wants it based on some purported gambling losses, alleged gambling losses, and an unauthorized biography. But Rory's like the guy should be here. And Tiger feels the same way. Now, will it take a miracle for Tiger to win? We'll spend more time on that with Shuey tomorrow. But this is, this is really good work by the PGA flexing their muscles with some incredible pairings. This is what you're going to get pairing-wise this weekend for the second major. It's a hilly course. you got to be long and strong off the box and do all the things you need to do once you get on the green to take it down. Tiger says his leg feels stronger than ever. So those are some cliff notes as we lead into Thursday's opening round. But the wow factor is major with the pairings, and it's the who's who with Rom and Scheffler and Morikawa. That's a great group. That's incredible. DJ, Thomas, and Cantley, Kepka, Lowry, and Scott. You have uh, Zalatoris, Smith, and Hovland, Shuffley, Matsuyama, Finau. I mean, some of these guys are waiting to break through for their first. Some of these guys are trying to recapture glory. And then you've got Tiger, Rory, and Spieth that are all trying to get back to that rarefied air. I know Tiger a recent champion pre-accident, but can he be better and stronger and be in contention into the weekend? And this is something we have talked about for years on this show. What breeds the best success? Competition. Competition. Mm -hmm. And these guys all have competition in in their pairings here uh, for the PGA Championship. I mean, that group of John Rahm, Scotty Scheffler, and Colin Morikawa is just, that's incredible. I mean, I, I could see any three of those guys coming out on top and well, obviously we'll have to talk with uh, with Shuey about this tomorrow to get his expert opinion because mm-hmm. I am by no means a golf expert but no. those three guys all playing pretty great golf right now uh, and then Tiger Woods Rory McIlroy Jordan Spieth that's got to be like the fan favorite group um, where uh, if I'm tuned into the PGA uh, championship this weekend that's the the pairing I'll be watching yeah you just hope everyone makes the cut yeah yeah and, and then and shoots incredible rounds so you get a star-studded showcase that you want i mean you're, you're starting off the right way and it has a high probability of being something incredible something that the saudi-based tour no matter how much money you offer can't replicate because the star power is still with the pga oh yeah it's it's the the, the who's who of golf is in the pga and, and i don't think the saudi league will ever be able to replicate that i mean shuey's told us a couple times you're playing golf at this level to play the Masters, to play the PGA Championship, uh, to play the U.S. Open, uh, to play the Masters. I mean, th- these are the golf tournaments that everyone wants to play. You don't want to go play some random invitational in London just because they're paying you a lot of money. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, the, the the legacy of these golfers is determined by what they do here on the PGA Tour, N- not by how much money they make. You're, you're, you're reckoning. You want the reckoning. You want the praise. You want the juice. Uh, Bryson will show up. He is still not sure if he'll play. Battling back from injury. We'll dive into this with Kaz coming up. And you have the uh, proposal here, a bill in California. They took the lead in, on NIL rights back in 2019. They were the first state to sign into law, Bill 206, uh, which made it illegal for the NCAA universities to prohibit third parties from paying college athletes to use NIL in endorsement sponsorships appearances. Uh, That means they didn't have to ask the athletic department to alter their budget, which allowed for an easy passage. On deck, Bill 1401, college athlete race and gender equity. It pretty much would guarantee California schools share 50 percent of their annual revenues in football and men's and women's basketball with their athletes initiating a new era of pay for play we'll get kaz's take on that hail varsity continues presented by the nebraska lottery and now and now back to hail varsity radio one final time this hour division talk and potential realignment all that good stuff. Kaz will join us. Rick Kaczynski. 
Mike St. James, Better Call Saul. We'll recap the uh, second to last episode before the midseason break and the final episodes of Better Call Saul this summer. So a reminder to get buckled up. Uh, coaches make substitutions during the game to get the best player on the field. Getting behind the wheel after drinking also demands a substitution. Sober drivers are the only choice. A DUI costs more than you think. A message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. So you just sent me this, Elijah. A team I kind of love to hate. A team everybody loved to hate, really, aside from one certain fan base. Trent Dilfer dirty to Super Bowl over the New York Giants. The Baltimore Ravens of 2000-2001. Ray Lewis. Shannon Sharp. And a cast of characters. It is in production right now for the next 30 for 30. They'll take viewers inside the world of one of the most notorious football teams ever to play. They boasted, they bullied, they brandished, they had bravado, and uh, they won. You couldn't beat them. And that was some black and blue football, man. You had the Ravens, you had the Titans. New England was on a bit of a hiatus after they had burst on the scene with Brady. And... There's a lot of things you can say about Ray Lewis, <laughs> but man, he was incredible to watch. That second Super Bowl they won that Sam Cooke was on and a big part of uh, back against the Niners. I think that was eight years ago against Kaepernick and Harbaugh. That was the swan song before Ray retired. Played a thousand years in the league, literally. He played double digit seasons and as good as a linebacker as there was him and Erlocker, of course, in that era. But this Ravens team, and I think they, I mean, it was Trent Dilfer that just pretty much handed off, and they ran the football, and they played great defense, and they won games 14 to 10, just like the Titans did. They leaned on a great defense. That was pre-Ed Reed, I believe, because Ed Reed was just getting out of Miami. I think they drafted it after the Super Bowl. That's how, how good they were. But no, I'll, I'll totally watch this. You have different... I thought the, the, the last 30 for 30, and it was on this weekend, the tuck rule game, I thought that was incredibly done where you're at, at Brady's pad down in Tampa, the mansion, looking out to Tampa Bay, and there's Woodson and Brady back and forth sitting down watch, re-watching that game with input from different members of the Patriots and different members of, of the Raiders team. This will be really good. And no doubt we'll check it out. And, you know, you're on one side of the fence or the other if you want to just get real, really down to it with my – in Nebraskans, I think there's a respect but, but, a, but a pretty high level of dislike, even for Ray Lewis, as great as he was, between the – the, the, the limo alleged murder incident and just being a Miami guy. Take caller nine right now. Beef up your backyard. Your chance at the smoker from Capitol Patio and the Flame Shop. A gift card to Russ's Market for some meat to throw on that smoker. Caller nine right now. Beef up your backyard. 466-3776. Pardon the interruption, but I'd like to save you some money. Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with Hale Varsity, and I wanted to offer listeners of this podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we produce, 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe and enter in the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's Hale Varsity dot com backslash subscribe promo code GBR.
Welcome to Hail Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hail Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Back into an hour two, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. A Tuesday with Kaz, Rick Kaczynski with his coach at Iowa and Nebraska. Kaz, what do you know? Not a whole lot, man. Same stuff, man. Just uh, getting warm down here. So just uh, pretty much same, man. Baseball track work. That's about it. Trying to keep you out of trouble, Schmitty. Stay out uh, of trouble. Are man. you a are you a are you a tank top guy? Are you a tank top no. guy? Dude, seriously, only a, only a country club guy would ask. Oh come on, like we're going uh, with the country uh, club backhand again. Guy. Are you kidding me? I I didn't know. Uh, I mean, no. you I know it. you're still sporting your '95 Orange Bowl tee with uh hmm. with the with the sleeves cut off. Yeah, Kaz cut always struck sleeves. me as a cut off guy. Okay, that's see, yeah, the cutoff versus the tank top. Fine, you, you remove the sleeves nah, for the gym. No, nah, dude, I'm wearing, I'm wearing, I'm wearing sleeves, or I'm, I'm, I'm in water somewhere. Okay, that's really, it, dude, come on, yeah, dude, are you kidding me? You wear Is a shirt when you swim. Top? When's the last successful human you've seen in a tank top? Like, on a, like can you buy a tank top anywhere? My brother-in-law, Uncle Andy, has a, a few bro tanks. He's all right. Dwayne the Rock Johnson's always wearing tank tops. I don't know, man. I'm not seeing many. <laughs> not seeing many. So Kaz is no on the tank top. Okay, All right. No, that's a no. That's a big right. no. So let's uh, let's shift over to some legislation, and uh, you look at what is ongoing with NIL, and California was the first to pass uh, NIL uh, in the in their Senate uh, back in the fall of, of 2019 to move forward. You have a new bill out, 1401, uh, named the College Athlete Race and Gender Equity Act, and it cuts to the the heart of the uh, amateurism debate, and it would require California schools to share 50% of their annual revenue in football and in men's and women's basketball with the athletes initiating a new era of of pay-for-play Kaz, what's your take on this? I mean, it's not gone through. It's not passed. But would this be a doomsday bill in law to potentially do away with a lot of the non-revenue generating sports? Yeah, I think that's I think that's the biggest issue. Is uh, you know, you take you take football and, and basketball out. Um, you know, the the revenue from football and uh, the uh, revenue generating sports are, are paying the scholarships and and everything else for uh, for all the other sports. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if even the TV contracts, especially in the in the pack. I mean, mm-hmm. the pack's going to have to do some serious renegotiation. But uh, re- renegotiations. But we're talking West Coast football. I mean, it's important to some people, but it's not like it is in the Midwest and the Northeast and the South. Um, I mean, it's an after afterthought. Uh, I just don't know if 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 you're counting on TV revenue to fund the uh, the Olympic sports. I, I just don't see the the Olympic sports being being around much longer. Um, man, uh, you know, because that's you're you're talking about you're talking about fifty percent. You take fifty percent of um, the revenue away. Look at Nebraska, mm-hmm. and you know how are you funding? How are you funding the non-revenue sports programs? So, I mean, good lord, that's uh, it, it's going to kill college sports, not necessarily football and basketball, but a lot of these Olympic sports I think would go away. I just don't know if there's enough money uh, from the TV contracts. Um, to uh, to garner enough steam to keep everybody else else afloat. Well, I, I don't know that you can. You would probably choose not to feed the other sports if it comes down to money, and you need it for facilities, you need it for well being. And to your point, everyone else eats a lot of times, most of the time, off of football or your big sport. And the other part of this bill, when you divide up the money 
with the, the total number of athletes. Uh, the example given in this L.A. Times article, each USC football player could make up to $200,000 a year. And about the 15 to $20 million that's currently being used to reinvest into football resources to fund the rest of the athletic department. On the other side of that coin, from a transfer and a portal standpoint and an NIL standpoint, if you transfer within another California institution, you still get to, to get that 200 grand accrued per, per year. But if you transfer out, you forfeit it. So th- there are some parameters, some safeguards on, 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 on transferring. I just, man, I, I just don't know. Best case scenario, you'll have the Big Ten making a new TV deal, a new media partner deal at some point. Don't know that it's going to double, but it's going to jump significantly. So potentially each school could be shy of $100 million a year. But even if you cut that in half, you're back to what you're making now, which is about $55, $56 million a year. Yeah. Well, also, too, I mean, what, are, what, are the, what are the student athletes classified as? It wouldn't be student athletes anymore, I don't believe. Um, you know, you're taking, you you got to take an account. I think they become employees. You know, can you can you fire them? I mean, what's, I, yeah, this this is this is crazy if this happens. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, uh, I mean, because clearly you're establishing an in a, an employment relationship between the two schools. I mean, you have a contract now. The way it's worded doesn't allow the players to be deemed employees <laughs> but it's 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 interesting i mean it, it, leave, the, it the, Cal- the, leave it to california <laughs> the wording the wording well i wanted to get your take on it i don't think it's a great idea either i'm not anti-athlete at all i just don't no, know that i mean this... come on though i mean that's not, this, this is we'll get this is getting ridiculous i mean it, it really is I mean, it, holy cow! They get, I don't know if you can get the reins back on. No, ever again. I just don't. I just don't think you can. It's uh, this may make it go man, from we, bad to worse, though. Yeah, yeah, and I don't. I just don't know what's what's going on. Now, I'm not. I'm not following it a whole lot, mm-hmm. but I can't imagine this not passing in California. You know, because all because all I'm sure all those. You know, hippies out there are just hey, what you know, give give people more. And that's that's all they look at. They don't, you know, there's no free lunch. It's got to come from somewhere, mm-hmm. and there's going to be consequences. And I doubt anybody's looking at the consequences right now. You know, I'm not that well schooled on it. I haven't read a whole lot on it, mm-hmm. but but if that happens, I mean, you, you know, what's between NIL and and then this for the California schools? You're just going down a route where. Uh, you're not going to recover from. I mean, and I mean, you talk about recruiting advantages. Mm-hmm. You're, you know, <laughs> you know 200k and all that. I mean, my my thing is, is you know, how how you as a coach, you recruit a kid, he's making this money, and he thinks, what do you do? You know, I mean, there's got there's got to be there's absolutely no leverage. It's uh, there's absolutely no leverage for for the institution or the or the coaches anymore. Yeah, if that goes through, but man, it's it's really disheartening, man. That's mm-hmm. all we talk about. You don't talk about the players hardly anymore. It's about what they can get and how fast they can get it, and who's going to give them more. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's a shame. I mean, you, you, when it comes to college athletics, especially football, I mean, hell, when's the last time people really had a football discussion? Every everything's about money right now. Yeah, it's shifting. It's 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 it's, it's crazy. It's crazy, and I mean, I and and, and try. I mean, hey, if, if this is the deal, if when my kid's coming up, hey, let's go get it. I mean, I, hey, listen, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm as good a Catholic hypocrite there is out there. I talk out of both sides of my mouth as much as I can, but you know, but it's just not. It's it's not good. I mean, it's just not good. I mean, but but I understand the whole way. Get your hey, if 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 it's if it's within uh, the spectrum of what you can get. Man, go get all you can get. Go get all you can get, man. You're talking about you're talking about money that giving kids head starts on life and you know and changing changing families family dynamics. So um, yeah, man, it's I'd take advantage of it if it was me. But man, not having anybody involved in it, it's uh, pretty scary. Don't don't like it. Don't like it at all. But not not sure where do you, where do you go next? 
I mean, <laughs> good Lord. Yeah, 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 it'd be yeah. nice to just talk about talk about football. That's where I'm going. That's where I'm going crap. next. Rick Kaczynski yeah, is with us. Kaz, let's uh, – what um, – what do you look for when it comes to evaluating JUCO defensive linemen? And and I ask that because you've got a a high market rate right now for scarcity with uh, with defensive linemen this late in the game. Nebraska's looking at another kid out of out of California JUCO. Didn't really have many offers. I think Washington State was it in January, and now because he's a uh, a JUCO guy that's gotten a little bit bigger, stronger, and faster. Uh, his recruiting's really blown up Nebraska in the race for him. But were you specific to regions with JUCOs, or if, if a guy came on your radar, it didn't matter where he was from? How did you kind of work that? Well, most of most of the uh, junior college players that I recruited, I had I had recruited before they went to junior college. Mm-hmm. Um, the ones that were already in junior college. Yeah, you, know, you did a lot of research on. It's still a it's still a crapshoot. Um, you know, the big thing was how quickly you can get them in the school. I um, mean, you you because you, you wanted it was hard to get a guy in August. You know, when were they graduating? If you could get a guy that was that was done in December, that way you got him in the spring, you got him all summer. Or you know, be, you know, second best scenario was you know getting a guy getting a guy there um, before summer session um, began. So, um, you know, that's that's the one thing you, that I looked at was, one, you know, did we recruit this kid out of high school? Two, you know, where's, what does he what does he need academically? Um, and then, then, then quite frankly, you, you know, we kind of looked at him just no different than a high school kid, you know, who, who he was playing against. And – you know, who's coaching them, you know, these guys, JUCO, you know, they struggle with finances, you know, they got, they got coaches making 10, 12 grand a year. So, you know, they're not getting the time and the coaching that they need. So, you know, you're looking, you're looking at it from a developmental type deal, you know, guy like Randy, you know, my wife can put on the film and say, yeah, that dude can run really fast and hit people really hard. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, you're, you're looking at, okay, can this guy bend? Um, you know, how big of a frame, if, if he needs to put on weight, will that slow him down? You're looking at his knees, his ankles, his hips, you know, how, how fluid is he? Is he stiff up top? You're not looking at, you're not looking at a whole lot different than you would a high school kid. Um, but you know, I, I can tell you this, a lot of these junior college kids are over recruited, especially defensive linemen. Um, there was a couple kids we recruited at, at Nebraska that we didn't get. Mm-hmm. Um, that never played it down anywhere. Never played it down. Never played it down. So um, you know, for a kid to be uh, and like I said, I'm not. I don't know anything about this kid. Don't know the kid's name. Don't know anything about him. But you know, a lot of people right now, man, you're just you're trying to find bodies. I mean, you need depth. Yeah. I mean, you need uh, you need you need people to to have to at least, like I said, make them make them go around you at least. Yeah. Um, so you got to have something to work with. And at least this kid, he's a little bit older. He's a little bit more mature, you know, physically. Uh, you just don't know what you're getting mentally. You just don't know what you're getting football IQ. Um, it's always, it's always a crapshoot, especially the further away you are from your, uh, from your campus. You know, you get Iowa Western kid, you know, about and there's specific programs, the specific coaches that you trust in the JUCO levels, and then there's just places that, you know, you would play with 10 before you would take a kid out of. So, Rick Kaczynski is with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Kaz, a lot of talk about doing away with divisions, the ACC, thinking about a, a permanent three and then kind of a, a five-team rotation. The SEC will possibly reship their divisions. Once Texas and Oklahoma, they get added to the West along with Missouri, and then you'll move Bama over to the East potentially with Auburn. We get to the Big Ten as the uh, ADs and the commissioner are meeting in Chicago for day two before the chancellors and presidents the first part of June. And would you reshift or reshuffle the Big Ten divisions? Would you go without divisions 
the Big Ten won't make a decision until presumably you know what's going to happen for the college football playoff expansion-wise, but the idea is to position yourself to have as many teams as possible in the playoff, not just your league champion. Would it make sense to, to reshuffle the deck here a bit? I'm looking at it from conference champion. I'm, I'm looking at it from getting the two best teams in the conference championship, if that's what you're going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the West just, I mean, it, a lot of times it hasn't even been a game. I mean, when you're looking at, you're looking at Ohio State, Michigan State, Penn State, and Michigan, you know, so, um, uh, that's, I think, what, since 20, 2013. It's been how it's been. Yeah, it's been all East. It's been how it's been. So it's all East teams. And I get if I was an East Coast, um, East Division coach, I'd be saying the same thing as, you know, sometimes those guys feel. I mean, I know some of those guys, they feel like the, you know, the fifth, sixth best team is playing in the, uh, playing in the conference championship game. So, um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those deals, man. You just don't know, um, you know, how it's going to play out, but you're already playing cross, you know, you got your, cross-sectional games and all that i say get get rid of the divisions if they're talking about it i gotta imagine it's gonna it's gonna happen um and big 10 things happen team, things happen rather quickly but i mean they can say all they want about the playoffs and whatever um get more guys in there but i think it, the most important thing is getting the two best teams playing each other in the in the conference championship game so pardon the interruption but i'd like to save you some money I'm Brandon Vogel, Managing Editor of Hale Varsity, and I wanted to offer listeners of this podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we produce, 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all of the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe and enter the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe. Promo code GBR. And we're back. Fellas, you think we could listen to the radio? On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! It's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. A Tuesday with Kaz, Rick Kaczynski with us. Did you guys look at the schedule and go, what the F sometimes, or did you care? No, y'all, no I mean... You always look at the schedule and, and kind of say, I mean, hell, you, you, you look at the schedule until the season starts. Sure. You know, you kind of look at it and you're like, man, like we're playing at night on the road in Camp Randall. We're playing at night on the road in East Lansing. We're playing at night in the road. And, you know, you're like, good Lord. I mean, you know, like what's <laughs> – but I guess it's a good thing, you know, when you're playing at night and it's prime time, that means that, you know, Either some either the person you're playing or you're doing pretty well. Yeah. So uh, so that's so that's a good thing. But uh, I think when Nebraska when Nebraska uh, joined the league, uh, that the Big Ten was going to make sure that they weren't coming in and um, you know the Big Ten didn't do didn't do Bo or uh, or the university any favors when when they came into the league. So. Those were those uh, those first couple of years, man. Those were some tough, 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 tough schedules in the in the league. So a little bit of little little hazing early on, huh? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think you, especially that two thousand wasn't there, but uh, you look at that two thousand eleven um, schedule, man. That was that was pretty rough, man. That was that was pretty that was a pretty rough schedule. So wasn't a whole lot of uh, that was a wasn't a big welcome to the Big Ten by uh commish delaney there at the time so well the, yeah you still got to get him but once you get into the season i mean you're just you're just you're just playing man mm-hmm. i mean you just you're just you're just playing when it comes to the uh, a chance of three permanent opponents and then kind of running through the rest of the schedule uh, i've seen that model as well and it makes sense doesn't it for nebraska to to team up and dance with Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota—that'd be the the the, the, yeah. round, the roundabout. I think you got to want and, and need if you're Nebraska. It's not been been good for you, but eventually you got to beat those guys. Yeah, that, I mean that's a yeah yeah. You're you're not you're not going to be one of the top two teams if you can't beat those teams. So um, that's what that's that's where you got to start. And I think too, you know, just regionally. Um, I think it. I think it just makes it makes sense. I mean, you, 
say what you want, but, you know, you know, bordering states and, you know, nearby states and, uh, you know, having a guy like Fleck at uh, Minnesota who's easy to dislike, you know, creates a lot of, creates uh, a lot of interest. So, you know, when, when you're looking at the schedule and obviously, um, you know, there's a lot of great conference games, but I, I think you know, you got to look at the ones that are your that are your measuring stick. That that those are going to tell you a lot about a lot about your team. And you know, if you beat if you beat Minnesota, you beat Wisconsin, and you beat Iowa in the same year, you got a chance to be pretty dang successful. I think the last time that's happened, you, know, you played in uh, whatever they were calling the divisions at that time. I think that was that was 2012. The last legends time that and happened. leaders, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a hat. I'll sell you. I'll make you. I'll cut you a deal. <laughs> well, yeah. What's what's the starting bit? I'm sure it's on eBay right now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> along along yeah. with your bro tank, big <laughs> <laughs> big ten big ten West champs, brother. That tank top. I know you rock at the pool. Jeez, good Lord, go. Rick Kaczynski. <laughs> Kaz, last thought here. If the Big Ten, say, did restructure their divisions and they end up adding one or two teams in order to get uh, to that even number of 16, you can maybe have four divisions of four. I mean, who knows what could happen here, but two of eight. if you're drafting teams here for the Big Ten, which teams do you think stylistically make the most sense based on well, a, both style and uh, location to join the Big Ten if that were to happen? Notre Dame, but it would never happen. I don't know. It would never happen, but that's the, that's the team that I'd love to see in the Big Ten. Just makes sense regionally, makes sense um, with the style of the style of play. But um, I just I just don't see Notre Dame joining a, joining a conference anytime soon. Um, Notre Dame, football. Cincinnati, maybe. Nah, I mean Cincinnati. Cincinnati will be good another year. It's just, uh, and, and the, uh, they've done a great job. Yeah. You just can't, it's, it's just impossible to sustain. Mm-hmm. It's impossible. What about Iowa it's, State? It, it's, it. Kansas, Kansas mm-hmm. and Notre Dame? No, nah, what, what are you getting from Kansas? Hoops. You guys get to go watch a hoop game every once in a while. Well, I know it's not, yeah, a, it's just, not a football Yeah, draft, you but. know, it's just Kansas. I mean, Iowa State, that, that, you know, nothing nothing real sexy about mm-hmm. that. I, I think, too, you got to look at academic. You know, you got to look at academic. Well, not sure. Key Hale Varsity Radio. Yeah, not sure what happened there. We lost him. We lost Kaz. That's sad. Good to hear from him, though. Plenty to get into. Plenty to talk about with Kaz, with not only the divisions, but also just how <laughs> that, that'd be really cool, right? Notre Dame, if you expand the Big Ten, you, you match the SEC's 16 you reconfigure at the time we all kind of just rolled our eyes at at Maryland and Rutgers but at the time from a TV standpoint it was all cable networks and subscribers now it's digital and all that's turning Commissioner Warning Warn I called him Commissioner Warning that wasn't nice that wasn't intentional but the Big Ten right now media wise keeping an open mind no timeline for them and Right now, they're thinking about the the combo of streaming or streaming only or, or having some sort of platform there. The current deal ends 2022-2023. He had uh, some of the athletic director brass say, look, that'd be really cool if the payday doubled from $54 million to $108 million. They don't anticipate that. I think the projections say by... 2029, maybe you could be it just right at $100 million per school. We'll see. And do you partner up with NBC? Do you stick with Fox and high tier ESPN ABC? You're partnered already with CBS for college basketball, TNT, and Amazon. I mean, you're going to have streaming come into the picture. Netflix has got to do something to shake it up. Maybe they go. For a sports property, and if you're looking at at tiers, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you could put games on those platforms, and voila, it's five extra bucks a month for uh, a Peacock or something like that if you don't already have it, while keeping things okay. 
uh, with your partnership, even though you own 51% of Fox Sports. Fox Sports owns, excuse me, 51% of the Big Ten Network. Keep things whole and money-making with your league network. But from a standpoint, like the, the Longhorn Network will go goodbye as soon as Texas joins the SEC. They'll just, you'll have the the SEC network continue to do their thing. But it's funny to think about the SEC network stomping <laughs> all over Bevo. <laughs> and the thing that broke up and drove people away, the uh, the Longhorn Network, and getting the payday they did back when is interesting. We'll talk with Bill Dolman about this. He's all over this stuff. Good story uh, from the World Herald on, on Teddy Prohaska. Teddy was out and about doing his thing last Saturday at Elkhorn South. Uh, they did a really cool NIL event uh, with Elkhorn uh, the Elkhorn teachers, Elkhorn athletes, and the participants from Special Olympics really love Special Olympics and what they uh, are and what they represent and uh, just the, uh, the the community that, that rallies and the, this phenomenal athletes that are Special Olympians. Well, Teddy kind of opened up a little bit here about where he's at recovery-wise and says – to the World Herald, he's about 80 to 85% recovered from surgery. It was that left knee against Michigan, wasn't it? Or Northwestern. Northwestern. It's Northwestern. Yeah, he didn't see him against Michigan. But he's 80 to 85% back, and he had the trifecta, man. That was the ACL, the MCL, the meniscus on that left knee. Uh, he was supposed to coach his teammates, but he ended up hitting a, a few threes with warm-ups. And last time you saw anything, it was him limping towards the the home tunnel, Memorial Stadium. He had 234 left to play in the first half in that game. It was against Michigan. It was against Michigan, okay. And he fell awkwardly while blocking for for Adrian, and he knew immediately things were serious. He heard a pop, and everyone says they hear that pop when it's bad. The MRI the next morning confirmed Teddy's big, uh, Teddy's worst fears, and that he'd miss the season and face a long rehab. Couldn't walk for two weeks, wore a brace for four more weeks after earning a starting role six games into the year. That got ripped away from him. It was pretty tough. Rehab's hard enough, and he said he'd never suffered such a serious injury. That's really devastating mentally to a guy as young as he is, as good as he is, as talented as he is, and they felt comfortable adding him as an extra protector off the edge. You saw him in spurts against uh, Oklahoma. And for him at such a young age, in in his football life, to have this injury, uh, it was a hurdle, but he's battled back. He's performed the grueling exercises required for this rehab, the blood flow restriction. So... Prohaska had to uh, wore a cutoff on his leg that restricted his circulation and that made those movements more difficult. It was pretty agonizing for him to perform those leg extension, those single leg squats while wearing a cuff. That was pain, but he battled through it. Nothing hurt uh, more than the isolation as well from his teammates. That's one thing with uh, Teddy Prohaska. He was a big cog in the recruiting process. If you think about it, getting guys together, and he built strong relationships, uh, said uh, Teddy. So good piece here with the World Herald you need to to read about and look at. And, uh, you know, what he's missed meetings, he missed practice time, he got treatment, but he's battling back 80 to 85%. The boot came off. The rehab's been slow. We're exactly at 100 days till football season. And, and with, with Teddy, it's I mean, 80 to 85%. He, you're a guy that, or he's a guy that, that needs to perform this year for the Husker offensive line. And just in order for them to, to find success, and based on what I can see what's in the room right now, based on how that room looked last season, he's a guy that y- you need results from if you want this offensive line to, to perform. He is in a limited sample size just like we did with Turner Corcoran you can make things happen with this offensive line from a protection standpoint from a firing off the ball standpoint he's your 
he's your best option at left tackle, and you got to get him healthy, and he's busting butt to, to get there. We'll talk Better Call Saul next. Like what you hear? High-quality radio and podcast is part of what we do at Hale Varsity. Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with Hale Varsity Radio, and I wanted to offer listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we produce, 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe and enter in the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hail Varsity. That's HailVarsity.com backslash subscribe promo code GBR. And now, and now back to Hail Varsity Radio. Back to you, it's Hail Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. We are winding down. It's about half time with Better Call Saul. We love doing this segment. Mike St. James, Better Call Saul aficionado. We always give our shout out to our buddy Timo, who's a, not only a close personal friend of Saul, Bob Odenkirk, but got us turned on to the show. Mike, what are we doing? How are you, man? I'm doing all right. Enough with the slow burn, though. I want something to happen in this show, and it should happen next week. It should before halftime. And can I say this? And, and people, you talk to folks about Breaking Bad and even Better Call Saul. The the biggest complaint was, well, it, Breaking Bad started too slow. I about gave up on it. I did give up on it. I didn't. But just folks you talk to, friends or buddies, that you got to talk them back into it, right? And then once... Once it hits, brother, it goes downhill. It's like Nebraska running through a Michigan State defense. I mean, it's <laughs> – In what <Mike>. year? <laughs> Pick. <laughs> yeah, you got to go back to uh, no. the Nick Saban days at Michigan State. I got to go back to 2015, your last playoff team. Well, okay, okay. <laughs> every, every show I work that in, Mike St. James almost came over the desk and punched me, and I was like, how was your weekend? <laughs> Uh, so, but I'm sorry, I got off on sports <laughs> take right there. But um, no, but you're right. I mean, the one argument about Saul or, or knock, if there is one, and this is sacrilege to like diehard Saul fans, but there's like two or three incredible killer episodes a season, like just great TV. Yeah. And then the rest of them are just like, I don't want to say it's jack around. But they meander a bit. They do. They they are they are freaking artists, and they don't care. And and like yeah, and just get and to I'll it, give man. Them this, though. Right? Yeah. In, in what was that? I said they are artists, but I'm just like get to it, right? I mean, let's let's yeah. speed this up. Yeah, but when they meander, it's still entertaining because the characters yeah. are great, the acting's great, the cinematography is always fun to watch. It's, mm-hmm. it's just such a cool show. But yes, it's time to make something happen. And and we got a little like you you go like season one, the Mike episode, the Mike backstory, one of the best episodes ever. Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul, the the uh, the, the the Nacho episode, right? Incredible. Yeah, as good as it gets. So. But but now we're we're waiting and and just to get you caught up, Lalo is going around Germany chopping legs off. Is that accurate? Well, yeah, I'm doing a little razor blade trick, man. That, that was pretty slick. That guy, it looked like that guy had him, you know. But of course, we know Lalo is not going to be killed by just some random guy in Germany. The uh, what episode are we on? Six. We're on episode six. Uh, the uh, break in in the series is is episode seven next Monday with Better Call Saul. Then it'll crank back up in about what four weeks, six weeks. Yeah. So yeah, it's like July, early to mid July. So axe to grind the name of the episode. What did what did you like? Lay it out for us, Mike St. James. Last night's we episodes. Learned, we learned a bit more about Kim. Um, you know, the child thief part at the beginning, because we had another episode last season where in the beginning we saw that uh, her mom was going to pick her up late after school and her mom's drinking, so Kim walks home. Mm -hmm. But now we see that Kim, even as a child, might have had a bad streak then, too. And then, of course, at the end of this episode, Kim's got her decision to make. She's got this opportunity for what she really wants, 
for this justice thing that she really wants. But she turns the car around because it turns out that she wants to get Howard more than she wants to help people. Yeah, she wants to sabotage, stick it to somebody that's really helped make her career. Howard is the law firm and the head of the, the, the head law partner that she used to work for. And they're going to pull some crazy career debilitating prank on Howard to ruin him. But it's it, yeah. the, the way this sets up, Mike, is it's going to cost her her opportunity and either she loses her career or more next week. Fair? Yeah, that that sounds like a good possibility. Did you notice that when she was flipping through the little black book at the veterinarian's office um, and found the, the card squeegee. in there for what? The, the, <laughs> the, the vacuum guy, right? The disappearance yes, yes, man. Yes, the best quality vacuum. So is, are, they, are they telling us, are they foreshadowing a little bit that maybe she's going to end up using that service? You know what? I wonder. I wonder if she is the first to jump into the deep end of the pool there, but I would have to think that that Better Call Saul, you know, Jimmy would would have would have known where she's at, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And and connected with her instead of Oakview and Omaha down the street from Mike St. James. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. There, there really is. There's a lot that we're just going to have to wait and see next next week though it's going to be directed you know how okay this past week this one was directed by the guy who plays gus Mm -hmm. and the week before it was directed by the woman who plays kim wexler so you had rookie directors and episodes that didn't really matter all that much next week we know the episode matters not just because it's the mid-season break but also because it's going to be directed by a guy who's directed a bunch of episodes And he directed the Say My Name episode of Breaking Bad. He's coming to direct the next week's episode. Bang. Good. So here's what I predict next week. I predict predict Mike gets to off Lalo. And I predict that Kim... Kim has to, to, to lam it. I think she, what they were going to do to Howard is, is bust. She, she gets busted. She loses her law license. She's facing jail time. And I think she disappears. As yeah. in, she, she contacts the vanishing guy with the new identity and set up. I hope she's not out of this series in the middle of the season, though. I hope they let her you, last. You, you, want a, you, want a, you want a swimming pool scene. That's what you're holding out for. Yeah, yeah, there you go. We need a wet ponytail scene. <laughs> Mike St. James, we're talking better call Saul. Overall, been a really good season and uh, halfway point. But for her to make that career-altering choice to turn around and go play Jack around with Jim and mm-hmm. or, or, or Saul instead of her career, man, she's just, she's just damaged goods. Period. At, is, at, the, at the heart of what she is, she's damaged goods. And the guy she's going after, Howard, he's already a sad sack himself. Oh, he, he, he felt his, bad for him. His wife totally he, married him for money. Yeah. <laughs> he makes her this ultimate latte, and she just dumps it in the travel cup. <laughs> it's Poor hilarious. Guy. He's such a wuss. I mean, yeah. He's such a wuss. He's going to therapy, and if you go to therapy, I'm not piling on you, but if you, he's doing therapy, he's, he's in a monster house. He's top law firm partner there is, and his wife is like, oh, well, I'm going to go schmooze with the country club folks. <laughs> Don't show up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, hey, but his problem, go ahead. his problem with Kim or Kim's problem with him is that he underestimates her. He always has. And in fact, right now, he thinks he thinks it's Saul. He thinks mm-hmm. it's Jimmy out to get him. He doesn't even realize that Kim is the main one who wants him taken down. Mike say James. Mike, we'll talk next week. I might have to come see you for this uh, finale. All right. There he is. Mike St. James. Thanks. Like what you hear? High quality radio and podcasts are just part of what we do at Hale Varsity. I'm Brandon Vogel, Managing Editor. I wanted to offer listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we do. 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, 
and all of the premium content we produce at HailVarsity.com. Just go to HailVarsity.com slash subscribe and enter the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hail Varsity. That's HailVarsity.com slash subscribe, promo code GBR. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time on a Tuesday, it's Hale Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Big thanks to Rick Kaczynski, Mitch Sherman, and uh, Mike St. James, Sparty Mike, talking better call Saul. Tomorrow, Charlie McBride, we missed Coach yesterday. Excited to run him down tomorrow. Mike uh, Shuhart, Shuey with Wilderness Ridge, the PGA on the eve. And uh, we'll fire up Mike Babcock. As well, chance for you to qualify here to beef up your backyard shortly. So here's your ABC rundown, your prime times. Georgia, Oregon on September 3rd. That's a 2.30. Notre Dame, Ohio State night game that uh, week one. Florida State, LSU on the Sunday of Labor Day, 7.30 game. Wisconsin, Ohio State, the 24th of September, TBA kickoff. Texas OU will be an ABC showdown, not Fox. And then uh, Florida, Florida State on Thanksgiving. I think that's Black Friday, the 25th or the Saturday, one of the two. So there you are for that. Still no releases. You know, Nebraska, Oklahoma will be a monster game. Some are predicting that Nebraska will have game day there in Ireland for them, Northwestern. And many are predicting Nebraska, Oklahoma to have game day if both are undefeated. Would you prefer an 11 a.m. kick or a 7 p.m. kick for Nebraska, Oklahoma? I think you got to do night game. I mean, I'm not inclined to disagree, but what do you think the, 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 the partners will do, the TV partners? I mean, it seems to be 11 a.m. has been their money spot. It is, but if you're ABC... Is this the one you go in on for for Nebraska OU? And I think you did Auburn Penn State last year. Because you did Auburn Penn State last year for the whiteout. That was your ABC night game. To me, that's that could be your 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 Fox big noon kick. Although Auburn's a really good night atmosphere as well. But I think you, you take Nebraska doesn't hose themselves. <laughs> they start 3-0. and You could have two, dare I say, ranked. I don't know Oklahoma's schedule leading into Nebraska yet. But they, I don't think they're in danger. You'd pray they're not in danger of showing up already with a loss. But no, I think, I think ABC takes the game. It's 2.30 or 7.00. That's what you want. Well, I'm trying to find other. What are the other games that day? Well, the, the other the other big game is Auburn Penn State. Yeah, is there anything else relatively intriguing? I'm scrolling through a no, list. No, because last year you were, despite the nostalgia, you were pretty. There there was a loaded slate last year on the 18th of September. There just was. There was a hundred good games. Auburn Penn State, Notre Dame, and Cal. That's already locked in for two thirty. Uh, Texas A&M and uh, the U. That's the other probably game that might draw some eyeballs. And so one's on ABC, one's on ESPN. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, get you qualified right now. Caller 9 to beef up your backyard. The Smoker from Capital Patio and the Flame Shop. The gift card for meat to Russ's Market. Giveaway end of May. Caller 9 466 A Huda Media Production.